Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to our weekly departmental meeting. So this week we've got an academic program with presentations by registrars. And unfortunately, um, we only have two presentations this week. Um, we couldn't um, uh, find uh, a third uh, person. So we're going to go straight into it. And I'd like to invite um, Dr. Bule Rambena to present a case on behalf of um, the Division of General Medicine. Uh, a title of her talk is The Greatest Mimicum. Over to you, Bulerwa. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can, sorry, can you see my screen? Indeed, we can. Please go ahead. Sure. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of the Department of Medicine, um, and my talk is called The Great Mimic. Um, so our case is a 45-year-old gentleman who has no past medical history, who's moved recently from the Eastern Cape, now presents with a two-week history of uh, respiratory symptoms, namely cough and shortness of breath, but he also had constitutional symptoms um, due to weight loss and night sweats. He also complained of lower back pain um, with difficulty mobilizing independently uh, to no, the extent that he- on your video. Uh, sure. S sorry. Um, right. Okay. Is that better? Pardon? Yep. Please go for it. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, right. Okay, so he co also complained of lower back ache with difficulty mobilizing independently to the extent that he was dependent on his sister for activities of daily living. Um, on examination, uh, his examination revealed a chronically ill gentleman who was wasted. Um, he had palpable cold abscesses on his skull and he was very tender over the sacrum. Um, there was no peripheral uh, lymphadenopathy. On the respiratory examination, he was not distressed, but he did have some crepitations in the right middle zone. The bulk of his findings were in the neurological system, where he was thought to be confused as he struggled to follow simple commands initially. Uh, his power was graded at four out of five on all limbs with normal tone in the upper limbs, but he was noted to have upper motor neuron signs in the lower limbs. Um, that were increased tone, uh, breast reflexes, and upgoing planters bilaterally, um, but the left was more affected than the right. The sensory examination at that point was inconclusive. He had some baseline investigations, which showed he had an anemia of chronic disease um, and uh, an elevated CRP, but he was found to have HIV with a CD4 count of three. Uh, prior to his admission to hospital, he'd had about two genes, sputum gene experts that were done in the community and they were negative. And the TP culture done on admission on sputum is still pending. Of note, he had a chest x-ray, um, which though it's a mobile x-ray, there's a suggestion of fullness in the hyla region. Uh, he's got bilateral small pleural effusion. Um, he's got a reticular nodular infiltrate, which is most pronounced in the right mid zone. Um, because of his presentation with uh, a bit of confusion and upper motor neuron in the lower limbs, the attending clinician at that time thought um, to get him an MR imaging of the brain and spine. So he went on to have an MRI of the brain um, and the whole spine. And on the brain, as indicated on the scan, he's got ring enhancing lesions. Um, I'm just showing you only one of them. And he had um, that scalp abscess that's pointed out. And on the spine MRI, he had over the point where he was tender on the sacrum, he had an abscess there, superficial abscess, uh, but also had a collection in, in an intrathecal collection that was. Um, compressing the sacral and lumbar nerve roots, which explained his lower, his, uh, lower limb pathology. 
um, he had further investigations. It was pus aspirated from the scalp abscess, which was sent off for an MCNS and TB investigation. The serum clot came back as positive, but um, the CSF had a mildly raised protein, but uh, a negative clot. And the, the it was acellular with a glucose of 2.4. Um, and the toxo serology, the IgM was negative with an equivocal IgG and uh, TB bacteria are still pending and he was found to have syphilis so this title was one. So at this point his work, the working diagnosis was that of a newly diagnosed man with HIV, a newly diagnosed HIV positive uh, man with a CD4 count of three who now presented with a clinical picture that was at that time thought to be compatible with disseminated TB on the basis of his ring enhancing lesions on CSF, his clinical presentation and the appearance of his uh, chest X-ray. Um, despite, and his urinary lamb was negative, sorry. Um, and he had a cryptococcal antigenemia and he was uh, classified as latent syphilis. And on this basis, he was started on TB therapy uh, fluconazole and penicillin and was uh, awaiting referral to a TB hospital. Um, fortunately for him, he was admitted to G13 and this prolonged his stay in the hospital by a few days. And uh, 10 days after starting TB treatment, the micro lab called to say that they ha they're isolating nocardia um, on the culture of the as abscess aspirate and on the PCR it was a nocardia abscesses. So the question then became is this disseminated nocardia? Um, is this clinical presentation explained by disseminated nocardia or is this uh, still TB with nocardia co-infection? I thought we'd revise a little bit of um, a little bit about nocardia. So nocardia is an uncommon gram-positive bacterial infection caused by aerobic actinomycetes that are found in soil. Um, it's an opportunistic infection, um, but it's noted that about a third of patients are immunocompetent, and it has the ability to uh, disseminate to any organ. Uh, the symptoms are very nonspecific, um, which is weight loss, um, night sweats, and could develop abscesses at the site of inoculation. And the major risk factor is immunocompromised from whatever cause, be it HIV, diabetes, or a malignancy. Uh, then diagnosis is largely based on identification of the pathogen on uh, microbiology. So on gram stain, you'd see uh, delicate uh, branching gram positive rods. Uh, you could also identify it on modified acid fast staining, which is the stain on the right, or on PCR sequencing. Um, as I've alluded to, the sites of it can infect any site in the body, but Often the primary site of infection is cutaneous or pulmonary. The pulmonary infection is, tends to be the primary site in more than two thirds of cases. And isolation of nocardia and sputum is always indicative of infection. And it's frequently misdiagnosed as TB because of how, of the, of how it presents. Um, I just thought I'd show you another example of um, chest X-ray nocardia. So this is just a probably a bad example, but it shows that it's indistinguishable really from what you would uh, expect in someone with tuberculosis. Um, the, regarding CNS disease, it, Nakatia does have a tropism for neural tissue, but uh, when you isolate it in CNS, it's likely, uh, it likely just represents dissemination from another site that has resolved or is a transient infection. And the hallmark of infection is with all sites is uh, the formation of abscesses. Um, and nocardia meningitis is an infrequent manifestation. Um, we thought we'd look at, because my patient is HIV positive and has no, well now confirmed nocardia, I thought we would look at the incidence of nocardia in HIV. Uh, I found one study that was conducted in South Africa and it was in, it's conducted in Barra um, over a two year period where they looked, uh, they looked for ca confirmed cases of nocardia from the micro lab. And in that two year period, they identified 10 cases um, 
from which six of those cases presented with a pulmonary presentation. They presented with symptoms similar to TB and they were being worked up for TB. And some had been started on empiric TB treatment. Two had presented with brain abscesses and unfortunately had demise by the time the myocardia was identified. And three had a cutaneous presentation. But in all of this, while it could not tell me the prevalence of nocardia in South Africa, what it does highlight is that uh, TB is still more common than nocardia, but if you will have a negative workup um, microbiologically for TB, it is to consider that nocardia might be the pathogen. Um, Another study that we found, I found was um, an autopsy series from uh, West Africa. Uh, so they basically performed autopsies on patients who had passed on it from medical wards in their hospital. Um, and of those patients, 247 had HIV. And of the patients who had HIV, 4% had nocardia. Um, and the vast majority of, of, the, of the pathology they found was tuberculosis in 35% of the patients they examined, um, which also still points to nocardia being a rare, being uh, that TB is more likely to be the correct organism in your patients, but to just consider that nocardia in your, in your differential. Um, then we thought okay, if we could look at to see if um, what the prevalence of TB and nocardia co-infection is um, and yeah well, through my search we only found very few studies um, the one that we did find um, was from Iran where they looked at sputum samples of 157 people who were being worked up for TB of that sample, 32 people had HIV, and of the 32 people, they found that um, uh, uh, four had um, acid fast bacilli for TB, but 6% uh, of their sample when they examined it had um, was positive for on PCR only for nocardia. So they didn't pick up the nocardia on on gram staining or on culture. They picked it up on PCR of uh, samples that had that were being worked up for TB and they found that about 6% of the samples had um, no cardia. And the last study that we looked at was this is tr tried to find a systematic review. Um, what I found was a review from 2001 to 2019 but um, they only included four studies in the in the sample, and what they found is of the study, studies, it didn't quite answer the question of whether um, what the prevalence of nocard what the prevalence of nocardia and TB co-infection was. Uh, just that it, they had a combined prevalence in HIV in people who are being worked up for TB of nocardia of 4.8%. Um, it is mentioned in the discussion that they have found some samples that had both TB and nocardia uh, no identified on PCR, but they don't quite put a number to how many samples that was. Um, and because nocardia's treatment is so different from tuberculosis, I thought we would just revise that. Um, so. It, the treatment is dependent on the extent of disease, if it's localized or disseminated. For localized cutaneous disease, a single agent, um, which is cotrimoxazole in most cases, for three to six months would be sufficient. Um, but you should have a low threshold to investigate for disseminated disease, especially in immunocompromised people. Um, in severe disease, it's recommended that you use two to three IV agents, and this is dependent uh, on whether there's life-threatening infection, then you would go for three IV agents. Cotrimoxazole is the backbone, um, and a variety of other antibiotics are effective, such as the carbapenems, aminoglycosides, and uh, cephalosporins and you would be guided by the sensitivity. The duration of treatment is quite long, um, but basically uh, for the first three to six weeks, 
you use IV therapy until there's a clinical improvement. And um, beyond six weeks, then you can, if you document a clear clinical improvement, you can switch to two oral agents, and that would be guided by your microbiological sensitivity. And the duration of treatment is at least six months, six to 12 months, but for immunocompromised people, you would uh, routinely continue to 12 months. Uh, so our patient, um, in consultation with IT, we felt that the clinical picture was wholly compatible with myocardia, and there was little evidence for concomitant TBS infection, especially as it had multiple negative sputums, and he's, the abscess was aspirated, and there was no evidence for TB on that, and he had an ultrasound abdomen that didn't show any evidence for TB and a negative lamp. Um, so he was managed with cotramoxazole and meropenem. Um, and unfortunately, he contracted COVID in the ward, and he is currently in G22, is reportedly stable. All right. So I thought our take home messages from the talk would be that while TB is still the most common opportunistic infection that causes. Um, ring enhancing lesions on CSF and um, that we should just entertain a slight, a broader differential diagnosis, especially when the TB workup is coming up negative micro, with micro. Um, and it's important to aspirate as many of samples as you can from different sites, just, uh, and follow up on those cultures even after patients are transferred. Because had he gone to Brooklyn, we may have missed that this was after all myocardia rather than TB, and he wouldn't have been treated. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Oliver, for that very, very interesting case. Uh, Nellis, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, thanks. Can you hear me? Uh, are you in the same room as William or one of you has to mute? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I guess I can use William. Okay. Thank you, Bulenwa, uh, for a, a very interesting um, uh, case. Um, I think when, when I got an email asking us to present, uh, it was striking that the main reason Bulala wanted to share this case with the audience was that it was very interesting. Um, and I, I thought it had a, a couple of uh, lessons, really excellent presentation, very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, case. And I think a big thank you goes to the microbiologist who gave us a call um, to highlight that they had, uh, you know, cultured uh, um, nocardia on, on this patient's species. And maybe another big thanks is to COVID because this patient was still within the system and therefore we could trace him easily and, and institute uh, appropriate uh, therapy. Um, I must say, or I must confess that um, I have very little experience when it comes to nocardia. I've possibly encountered less than a handful. Guess where am I kidding? This was my first. And um, we, we, you know, very grateful for, to Fiona for, you know, uh, you know, rising up to the occasion and represent ID when we needed input and in answering the, you know, the question on whether this was all disseminated nocardia or this was a concomitant TB and, and um, nocardia um, uh, infection. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, I think what Bulelo highlighted in that presentation that it's, you know, nocardia is a very, you know, uh, is a very great mimicker and, and it masquerades beautifully uh, as TB. And one wonders, um, you know, how many cases uh, has, one has missed, you know, um, uh, treating for TB when, uh, when it was um, nocardia. Um, and maybe the last, you know, one of the take home, if I can just simplify it, is if it uh, walks like a duck, but it does not quack like a duck, as in the x-ray looks like it is TB um, and cavitating, but yet the sputum is negative for TB, 
one must uh, think of uh, other opportunistic um, infection and therefore cultures and following up on these cultures because nocardia is one of the slow growing um, organisms. So following up on cultures uh, is, is very, very important. Um, I, we did try to invite uh, microbiology to comment on whether they routinely um, uh, do, uh, uh, you know, nocardia PCRs or endocultures on, on these patients. And unfortunately, uh, Dr. Hoa couldn't join us and couldn't find someone on short notice to come and, and comment. But from the brief discussion that we had, it sounded like they, you know, if they, they spot something on gram stain that looks like it, especially on blood or any other body fluids, but not sputum, then they look um, for, for no, nocardia. Um, I, I think Graham is in the audience, perhaps, if he can share, um, you know, uh, some of his wisdom when it comes to no, nocardia, we will appreciate it. But yeah, I also thought it was an interesting case, but I think I, I learned uh, more from this gentleman than I've learned in a while. And it was nice to sort of, you know, read about something other than COVID um, for, for a change. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Akwin. Yeah, th thanks, Palalwa. That was a very comprehensive presentation and uh, a good reminder of one of the mimics of disseminated TB in patients with advanced HIV. I think this kind of clinical picture over 90% of the time, it's going to be a disseminated TB, but we always need to remember that there's a small group of patients that present with a clinical picture that resembles disseminated TB and they have other diagnoses and it's obviously disseminated fungal infections and lymphoma, but nocardia is certainly one of them. I've only seen a handful of cases myself uh, over the years. Um, but, you know, th I think as you were going through the presentation, I was thinking to myself how, how you know, you, 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 know you, you got the diagnosis when the culture came out positive and that was after 10 days. How could one make an earlier diagnosis here? And, you know, I think one of the things that we've lost uh, in that we're not doing um, acid fast staining on the pus anymore um, is that uh, that would have potentially given an earlier diagnosis um, because obviously you see acid fast uh, rods, uh, branching filamentous rods uh, that are morphologically very different to TB uh, but would be uh, very suggestive of nocardia. And so, if, 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 am I correct that the, the, um, that the expert on the pus was negative? Uh, the gin expert on the pus was yes. negative, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think, and it's just really in hindsight, you know, that one would say that, you know, on pus, if it is TB, that uh, the expert has very good sensitivity. So if it comes back as expert negative, uh, then one should think you know, of, of other organisms like uh, that it could be, you know, potentially um, a, 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 a fungus or, or nocardia and, and, and consider the differential diagnosis of the expert on the pus. Uh, is negative, so that one could then ask for an acid fast stain on, on the pus. Uh, that's, that's one point um, that I wanted to make. And then the second point is just to really emphasize uh, the treatment of CNS disease, particularly in immunocompromised patients. Hi, Graham, we've lost you there. It looks like uh, Graham is uh, having a poor connection from his office. So I see there are some comments are in the chat and maybe I can ask uh, Gary Martin to just briefly comment on the appropriate management of um, Nocardia. Gary? Hi, I, I think Bilal will cover the management expertly. And I completely agree that when it's disseminated, and especially in the brain, you need to add other agents to cotrimoxazole. Um, that Lucas paper that showed 10% um, had no cardio, well, basically it was one to nine ratio, got me very excited years ago. And I went through a couple of years of culturing no cardio from the sputum of every single <laughs> TB HIV suspect and found none. <laughs> I have seen a few along the way, um, but you know, no more than 
five or 10. And in that same period, I've seen probably a similar amount or slightly less in people who are apparently otherwise immunocompetent. So it is a rare TB mimic in both HIV positive and HIV negative. Thanks very much, Gary. And then finally, I'd just like to invite uh, Lawrence uh, to comment briefly on the uh, full uh, neurological uh, spectrum of disease uh, from myocardiosis. Lawrence? He might be having connection issues as well. We, we had to log out and log in again, so I'm not, not sure. Well, if not, um, let's... Uh, I'm, I'm back. If, if, oh, okay, uh, wonderful. Could you <laughs> just finish? I got taken down mid-sentence there. Um, Sorry. So I, I just wanted to make a very brief point that, you know, I think Gulal was made it, is that with CNS disease and in, in my com immunocompromised patient is, is uh, you know, requires the most intensive and prolonged therapy. And some people would start with three agents intravenously and for six weeks, and then only turn to oral uh, once there's been clear radiological and clinical improvement, and then treat for at least a year. Uh, and the, uh, you know, tailoring the, the treatment based on the susceptibility testing. Thank you very much, Graham. Uh, and thanks uh, for the comments uh, that people are posting through the chat function. So I will uh, refer people uh, to those. And next I'd like to invite uh, Wilhelma Enresa to present uh, our next um, case, which is titled New Weapons Against an Old Foe. Over to you, Wilhelm. Would you like to upload your slides? Can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, let's move this. Yeah, so my, the title of my talk is uh, New Weapons for an Old Foe. And we'll start with a case presentation of a patient that we took care of. Uh, she was a 53 year old lady referred from Heidefeld Emergency Center. She had a background of hypertension. She was HIV positive, diagnosed in 2016, but never started on ARVs. And she had a CD4 of 17. She had previous pulmonary TB in 2015 and completed treatment for that. She now presented with hypoxemic respiratory failure. She had a 10 day history of coughing, shortness of breath, weight loss, and reported anosmia. No fevers or night sweats were reported. On presentation at HEC, she was in severe respiratory distress, uh, saturations noted at 30% on room air, respiratory rate of 48. She was subsequently placed on a non rebuiver mask and transferred to Kuritiski. On arrival at C15, uh, she was on a non rebreathing mask, at saturations of 87% and a respiratory rate of 46. She was transferred to C5 and commenced on high flow nasal oxygen during the evening. This was a chest radiograph and obviously demonstrates bilateral lung involvement. Her blood results note that the CD4 count is 17, um, a normal microcytic anemia, and mild acute kidney injury. Additional investigations that were performed, we got a SARS-CoV-2 PCR nasopharyngeal swab, which was negative. We also had a sputum sample that was negative. A single gene expert sample was negative and the urinary lamb was negative as well. So this is just a broad approach to hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, you can categorize it into these categories, basically inadequate PaO2, PQ mismatching, uh, shunting, whether it's intrapulmonary or intracardiac, and diffusion abnormalities. And this is just a diagram to assist with the diagnosis. Our patient had bilateral alveolar opacities uh, with hypoxemic respiratory failure, new differential there would obviously be ARDS, acute hypersensitive pneumonia, AIP, your diffuse alveolar hemorrhage syndromes, certain drugs, uh, toxic inhalants, ingestions such as paraquat, uh, certain connective tissue diseases such as lupus pneumonitis, malignancies, and of course infections such as Legionella, uh, PCP, and viral infections. 
So this patient was commenced on a high dose cotramoxazole and prednisone for clinical assessment of PCP pneumonia. A second sputum sample was sent two days later to investigate for pulmonary TB, and this patient, this sample came up positive. At this point, she was then started on TB treatment. So this is a diagram of just a high flow nasal cannula setup. Um, it's connected to wall oxygen. Um, it's got a flow meter and a, a air blender, um, a humidifier chamber, and then a circuit to the patient which connects to high nasal cannula. So it involves the generation of warm humidified air, which is then delivered through the nasal cannula at very high flow rates to the patient. Um, it's generally well tolerated because it's heated and humidified. Um, delivers a very high FiO2, um, can have a slight element of PEEP, um, and it's, it's a, it benefits the patient by providing washout of carbon dioxide and this dead space washout. Um, so this is a picture of an MRI and they're taken by a gamma camera, uh, which labels the air, basically it's during a breath holding. Um, and then the control sample shows the air accumulates in the nasal and oral pharynx and when patients place on high flow nasal oxygen, it washes away the dead space. So it's, it's well tolerated. There's no significant contraindications. Patients are able to eat and communicate while they're on it. It can be used in non-critical care settings, such as side care units, um, and even some general wards. Um, the risks include potentially delaying intubation, which may be required. And there was concern about the risk of dispersion of bioaerosols to the environment, and obviously the danger to staff. So pre-COVID, um, there's been a number of studies on high flow nasal oxygen, most of them and not really promising. Uh, this is a meta-analysis uh, which included patients at risk of respiratory failure and basically it's failed to demonstrate um, a decrease in the rate of intubation um, and also failed to decrease mortality. Uh, this is an observational study um, which actually showed that high flow nasal oxygen should not delay intubation as um, when intubation is delayed that these, pa these patients have worse outcomes. Um, and a higher ICU mortality. But of course, this changed during COVID. So observational studies that we've done during the COVID era demonstrated significant benefit of high flow nasal oxygen um, in certain cases, depending on the COVID phenotype, usually the L phenotype of AODS benefits from it. Um, at this point, the risk of bioaerosolization is unclear. Um, it's likely to be different amongst different pathogens. However, we've also done studies during the COVID pandemic, which has showed a similar risk to standard oxygen masks that we use. Um, so this is just a summary of some of the studies, and um, you know it shows the dispersion distance um, in centimeters of high flow nasal cannula. You know, it's less than non-rebreathing mask and less than a 40% face mask. Um, this is of particles of less than one micrometer. Other things to consider is um, it requires very high amount of oxygen and obviously many hospitals won't have the infrastructure to implement its use. Back to our case, um, our patient subsequently started to improve when she started TB treatment. Her oxygen requirements decreased and we were able to wean her. And then five days later, we discharged her and she walked out of hospital. Um, on TB treatments with a view to start the antiretroviral therapy at a clinic. So the success of high flow nasal cannula during this pandemic has brought back into the spotlight uh, using this as a treatment modality, especially in our resource limited settings. Um, and whilst we may be finishing with the COVID pandemic, um, we are certainly haven't defeated our own HIV epidemic and its associated mortality. Um, we're excited that the high flow nasal cannula may give us an opportunity to treat patients, uh, which in the past would have you know, required ICU care, um, which is obviously limited. Um, so further guidance on the implementation of this modality and the conditions precluding its use deserves urgent thought um, and discussion. Thank you.
Thanks very much, uh, Bell Helen. So I thought uh, we would show uh, this case uh, for, for two reasons. Um, one, because uh, in the last few months I've been working in this service, uh, we've managed um, quite a few patients uh, who came in with respiratory failure. Um, and uh, I can think of at least three uh, who've uh, subsequently tested positive uh, for tuberculosis and a lot more um, that we um, had a diagnosis of PCP. Uh, and they've all done very well uh, in the main. Uh, and so to just remind people that uh, um, patients presenting with respiratory failure uh, do well uh, when this is managed uh, with high dose uh, oxygen if there's a reversible or treatable cause. Uh, and then secondly, uh, to remind us uh, that um, even in the era of COVID, uh, many of the patients uh, um, who present with uh, respiratory failure will not always uh, have it as a consequence of COVID-19. And so one needs to always uh, keep a um, high index of suspicion of uh, other causes of respiratory failure, which uh, Ben Helen uh, has demonstrated uh, beautifully in his talk. Uh, the other consultant who I share the word with, who also looked after this patient is Graham, uh, and I'd like to invite him uh, to just make some comments uh, before we open this up for discussion. Graham? Thanks, Dr. Becker. Yeah, I mean, I think this patient, um, you know, the, the cause of the uh, severe respiratory failure was most likely PCP and then had TB co-infection, um, you know, with that chest X-ray appearance. Um, and, uh, you know, that um, obviously the COVID is not completely excluded. Um, the, the fact that uh, the swabs and the sputum were negative make it unlikely, but we know we've seen patients with negative, uh, negative uh, swabs and negative sputum and still a very suggestive chest x-ray. But, you know, the bi bilateral diffuse ground glass infiltrate rather than a peripheral distribution, uh, rather than uh, kind of Apache appearance was, was supportive of PCP. And, and she actually had quite a rapid response on high flow, as, as Willem said, she uh, did reduce her, you know, it, it was able to be weaned uh, despite a very extensive infiltrate within, within a few days. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, and the issue of co-infection with TB and PCP, there was one study done in Johannesburg uh, in terms of lab, uh, lab confirmed co-infection. And, and I think from what I remember, I think there was 20% uh, sort of dual infection. So, it does happen and sort of in all of our TB patients, uh, all of our PCP patients, we should also look for TB. And Tobacco, we're not, we, you're on mute. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so I've invited um, uh, Greg Caligaro and uh, Sean Wasserman uh, to make some comments and I note uh, Gary's hand as well. So we'll go in that order. Let's start with you, Greg. Um, well, uh, well done on a great presentation, Bill Hallam, and thanks for asking me to comment on Tobacco. Um, I think um, I just wanted to agree with what Graham said that I think the radiology wasn't typical for um, TB and I, I think, um, uh, you know, dual infection is highly likely. And, uh, you know, when we see a case like this, we really have to think about all of those patients with PCP that were denied ICU admission or other forms of oxygen therapy. Um, when, let's be honest, high flow is a relatively simple form of oxygen administration. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, advantage is really in the fact that it humidifies and, and warms oxygen um, in a way that um, is tolerable to the patient. And in fact, it's, it's much better than non-invasive ventilation in terms of comfort and, and, and patient acceptance. Um, I did want to say that um, your, your literature review, um, did, uh, you didn't mention that there was, there was one recent um, systematic review and meta-analysis from intensive care medicine in 2019, which included a few of the newer uh, and bigger RCTs of high flow. And um, that actually did show that there was an advantage um, in reducing the need for mechanical ventilation with the number needed to treat of about 22. Um, it was quite a heterogeneous group of patients that they included in um, those with acute left ventricular failure, bacterial pneumonia. There were patients that uh, 
had bilateral infiltrates and had hematological malignancies or transplants where we know that um, invasive mechanical ventilation usually is associated with a poor outcome. Um, so I think there is some evidence showing that it is, um, um, that it does uh, reduce the need for mechanical ventilation, but I think you also correctly pointed out that there has been concern that if used indiscriminately, um, people might you know, miss the boat and, and, and not identify patients when they need to be mechanically ventilated. And I think the one point I would like to stress that is that patients who are severely hypoxic should always be considered for invasive mechanical ventilation because it is a much safer modality. But um, when you're dealing with a, a patient who's unlikely to be admitted to ICU, and we know that historically our ICUs have been reluctant to admit people with PCP, um, and or where you know that the condition itself um, has got a poor outcome with mechanical ventilation. So your immunocompromised hematological stem cell transplant patient with pulmonary infiltrates or, or patients with COVID pneumonia, as we know, the, the outcomes of mechanical ventilation have been variable. Um, then I think it's a very good modality. Um, yeah, and congratulations on a, on a great talk. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Um, Sean? Thanks, and Tobacco. Uh, well done, Will. That was a great talk. Uh, you covered uh, this very well, and Tobacco, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, so just to emphasize Graham's point that TB co-infection is common with PCP, we did a study at Crudescure a few years ago, uh, a, a retrospective description of PCP cases. And in that cohort, which included about 124 cases of PCP, about half were confirmed up to almost 25% had TB co-infection, new TB diagnosis with the PCP diagnosis. So it happens often and uh, it should be actively excluded. Um, so, you know, just to say that, um, uh, you know, we, we all know that, uh, that outcomes are with mechanical invasive ventilation um, and PCP are pretty dismal. Uh, they range, so survival in ICU when patients are mechanically ventilated ranges from about 40 to 70%. It's been getting a bit better, but kind of hovers around 50%. In our setting, it's about 40% when we looked at it. Um, and, and so an intervention that could uh, avoid the need for invasive mechanical ventilation is obviously very appealing. Um, people have looked uh, actually quite a lot at, uh, at non-invasive ventilation for, for PCP in both HIV and non-HIV infected patients uh, using CPAP and uh, positive pressure ventilation um, in uh, multiple uncontrolled studies uh, and also kind of non-randomized non um, comparator studies. And the, the findings have been pretty consistent and they've been very positive. So um, in these studies, uh, use of non-invasive um, ventilation for PCP results in avoiding intubation in up to 90% of, of patients. Um, and in those that avoided intubation, um, that was associated with much better survival compared to patients that went on to get intubated after failing um, non-invasive um, uh, approaches. Um, also results in reduced ICU stay, reduced nursing demands, as we've seen from, from high flow oxygen, and um, not surprisingly reduced ICU complications. Um, you know, because the kind of ultimate pathology and clinical picture of PCP and, um, and COVID is actually pretty similar, you know, diffuse alveolar damage, um, uh, reduced gas exchange, hypoxic um, pneumonia, um, and similar radiology. I mean, it just um, by extension seems like high flow oxygen would potentially be a, a very interesting and valuable intervention for PCP. And I think it's something that we should kind of, you know, try and implement and systematically uh, report on. Um, one small minor potentially potential consideration with use of high flow for PCP is nosocomial transmission, which is, I think, under-recognized. So PCP can be transmitted um, and probably is dominantly transmitted in the air. Um, there have been multiple reports of clusters and outbreaks in hospital in transplant units. And it's just an interesting consideration and something we should think about. And maybe when we use high flow um, for, for this indication and others, patients should be preferably in a side room. But I'm not sure it's a major issue. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. Uh, Gary, you have your hand up. Um, I actually took my hand down because most of my questions were answered, but um, we, we've we used CPAP over the years before high flow with mixed success in PCP. And I just wanted to know from Greg, are there head-to-head -head trials of high flow versus CPAP? 
uh, what is the cost of high flow versus CPAP? I mean, I know that high flow was used very widely in the COVID, uh, well, an ongoing COVID situation, but what about CPAP? It's, I think it was probably possibly more widely available and at one of the COVID echoes, there was a group from the UK who'd used CPAP rather than high flow and also reported good results. So are there any head to head RCTs and if not, why not? Why not you? <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, that's a great question. Firstly, I'm not aware of any trials on, on high flow in PCP itself. So um, I, there's definitely no randomized control trials um, comparing that and CPAP in PCP. Um, so the mechanism of increasing uh, oxygenation in CPAP is because the application of some positive pressure raises the mean airway pressure. And, and in some pathologies, that's obviously useful because it also helps to open atelectatic alveoli um, and, and recruit some dependent lung units. So, so that's something that, that high flow doesn't do. It's a, it's a pure oxygenation technique. Um, I think that CPAP from a, a, a mechanistic point of view would be the preferred way um, to treat patients with hypoxemia because as I said, it does recruit lung units, but it comes at a significant nursing and patient comfort cost as anyone who's looked after a patient with CPAP will know. I mean, the masks are cumbersome, and they leak and patients have to be watched very closely because um, they, um, particularly if they're on high FIO2s, if the mask displaces, they can um, desaturate very rapidly. And then there's the added discomfort to the patient that they can't eat or drink or take in anything orally while they're on CPAP. So um, I, I don't think this is an efficacy argument. I think it, it's also um, a patient comfort and, and it's, a, it's a much uh, less, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, well, I don't want to use the word complicated, but it's a it's 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 a it's a less onerous therapy to apply both for the patient and for the nursing staff, and also the requirement for monitoring. Um, but you're right. I mean, this should be something that should be tested in a controlled trial. But really, the way that we um, settled on high flow was was a, 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 a it's as a compromise. So I don't think we can really. Um, say that it's better than non-invasive ventilation for respiratory failure, but it's, it's better tolerated by patients and it can be scaled up um, easier without um, the need for close monitoring and, and, uh, and low nursing ratios. So Greg, what do you think of writing up our experience? I mean, I think in the last uh, five, six months, uh, I can think of 10 uh, patients that we diagnosed with PCP who have done very well. Um, on the high nasal flow oxygen that I've been involved with, and I'm sure there must be um, quite a few more, uh, in other words, uh, who have been managed. And it might be uh, an interesting uh, preliminary report. I agree. I mean, the one advantage in PCP is that um, high flow, because it doesn't generate high airway pressures, is uh, is, it is a lower risk of pneumothorax, which we all know is a, is a complication in PCP with pneumatoceles. And I mean, people have used very high pressures on CPAP of 15 to 20 centimeters of water. So, I mean, high flow does have that advantage um, and it can oxygenate people through the worst of, of the illness. So, I mean, I think it's definitely something to look at. Mm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bill Helen, for a fantastic presentation that's generated a lot of uh, interest and discussion. And uh, I'd like to thank both of our speakers today and all of you for attending. And we'll see you next week. Keep well.